So anyway, once again, I'd like to welcome all of you here. And um, normally this is a class lecture for the whole thing. Too much smoke? Yeah. Too much smoke? You guys. My class is already into this, but you guys. All right. OK. So anyway, what I've been asked about, what I've agreed to talk about tonight is the universe and how we know it. And I know this is like a huge topic, duh. Um, and those of you who are coming from biology or physics or astronomy or philosophy, first thing I want to do is just please cut me some slack tonight because I'm not going to try to address every single question. The nice thing about being an anthropologist is we can always use an anthropological approach. And I'll introduce the kind that we're going to use in a moment. Um, but what I'd like to do for you today is to give you a little bit of an idea about how anthropology considers this type of question and to also try to, from that perspective, show you what it kind of means to be a human being living in, living in the universe that we live in. So um, this is an old German wood carving from the medieval times. And the subcaption is, man breaks through the infinite cosmos of the Middle Ages. And you know, it has a whole bunch of symbolic things going on here. You could say on the one hand, you know, this is the mystical experience when we finally get through our normal reality and we kind of see through what's deeper. Uh, this particular caption from the book that it was about from is kind of indicating that, you know, we got our mind expanded when we kind of got away from just believing what we believe because that's what we were taught to believe. And in this case, using the scientific method. So it's always good and it's always helpful. And if you guys ever have to give a talk like this, the nice thing about it, and you remember, this is a big tip from me to you, define your terms. And the nice thing about it, when you give the talk, you can define your term the way you want to. And um, so, you know, that already kind of gives you a little break in how you do it. So I just went to my little Random House College dictionary that I've been using for years and years and years to define words in case I didn't know. And I pulled out the definition of reality, which as you can see is a noun. And you know, the, first, the thing that I was always taught about defining something is don't define something by using the word itself. And so like the first three definitions are already kind of sketchy. The state or quality of being real, resemblance to what is real, a real thing or fact. OK, that's really helpful. I like the philosophical one, something that exists independently of ideas concerning it, and even deeper, more profound, something that exists independently of all other things and from which all other things derive. And the way I want to talk about reality tonight really corresponds to those bottom two, but in particular, the 4A, something that exists independently of ideas concerning it. But as we're going to see, much of our reality, much of our myth concerns the stories that we have. And then, of course, we've got to have a little bit of an idea what a myth is. And I was a little disappointed in this one because anthropologists view myth in a little broader way. But we'll start with this one because this is what you guys probably are all trained. A traditional or legendary story usually concerned with deities or demigods and the creation of the world and its inhabitants. A story or belief, I like this part, that attempts to express or explain a basic truth, an allegory or parable. We'll get some mileage out of that too. Uh-oh, a belief or a subject of belief whose truth or reality is accepted uncritically, such stories or beliefs collectively. And I found out there's even a word, because when I was looking this up, I ran into it, mythomania, kind of cool word. Mythomania refers to people who kind of collectively cling to this one idea, I guess even in spite of all evidence to the contrary. But as we're going to see tonight, that's kind of what culture is all about in some levels. So again, because I get to define my terms and how I use it, and because the type of anthropology I do <coughs> takes both culture and the biological side of being in human in, co in consideration, we're going to use a biocultural approach here. And I just want to spell that out for everyone. My class students, my students know about this already because it's the very premise of our class this semester. But for those of you who are not from this class or maybe have not heard this type of approach, I just want to kind of lay it out there. 
The idea is that humans are biological organisms, we're animals, but our primary way of adapting or adjusting or surviving in the world is through our culture. The premise being, any of us as biological organisms, if we would have been raised among a different group of people, would have learned a different culture and consequently would have learned to adjust to the environment they live in using that culture. By the same token, when you and I travel to another place, we already bring with us the culture we've learned and we might be in the very same place as people of another society, but we're looking at it in different ways. This is an idea we'll explore briefly tonight too. So, I'd like to start off with a super hardcore science quote. I read this many, many years ago when I was working on my own dissertation and it was just one of those, you know, every once in a while you run into a quote that's just so pithy that you have to write it down and use it over and over again. Each of us lives within the universe, the prison of his own brain. Projecting from it are millions of fragile ner sensory nerve fibers in groups uniquely adapted to sample the energetic states of the world around us. Light or heat, light, force, and chemical composition. This is all we ever know of it directly. All else is logical inference. Those italics are in the original. Vernon Moncastle, in case you're not sure, was a neurologist. So he studies the brain and its anatomy. And what he is saying, and I think this is a premise that I can agree with as we start tonight, is that basically we do not know for sure what is going on outside of us. You have a brain and it's wired into learn about the outside world and that wiring, so to speak, is the product of our ancestral past. And we're going to explore a little bit of that tonight. But right off the bat, what does that tell us? That tells us in a certain sense, if we understand reality to be what's going on around us, then it's already a basic biological fact that reality is inaccessible to us directly. When I was a little kid, I remember seeing a little cartoon and it was about the blood and there was like, a, it's called Hemo the Magnificent for you trivia buffs. And there was a part of it where it showed like a boxer kind of getting knocked out and cut to a cartoon, it was really cool. And there was like this little guy looking out the boxer's eyes, driving him around. And then the boxer got a knockout punch and he's down on the ground and the, the little guy that drives him around is laying in the corner kind of dazed. And then the little guy wakes up and then he's got to get back in the steering wheel and get the boxer to get back up. And I liked that story when I was young, like that image, because I think it kind of, well, I don't know about you guys, but with me, kind of corresponds to sometimes what I naively think is going on. There's like this little John inside my head driving me around. And, you know, I could do this regression thing. You know, I've seen how John has changed and gotten older and all that kind of stuff. So I can regress back to when I was younger. But, it, you know, it's the same John that's driving me around. And I could kind of project forward that, you know, maybe that John is what's going to be with me until nothing is with me. And I think in some cultures they might think that that little John or their version of whatever it is is what comes into the body when you're conceived or when you're born and leaves your body when you die. And maybe even takes off for a while when you're dreaming. That view does not fit our biological view. Our biological view is everything that you are experiencing right now is a construction. It's a product of our brain architecture, the nerves that we use to perceive things with, and things like that. So let's talk a little bit about where your universe is made. This person whose brain you are seeing is undergoing surgery to separate the two hemispheres of their brain from one another because this person is suffering from extreme epileptic seizures. They are having multiple seizures per day, making them totally unable to function in any kind of socially normal way. Thing is about this kind of surgery, especially when you're doing this epilepsy, basically what you have is you have little tiny pieces of the brain, it could be there for example, where the brain cells, the neurons start functioning or firing a little more erratically. And then if that firing gets out of control, then it can spread like a wildfire across the brain. And as it activates different parts of the brain, those brain parts in turn activate or control the parts of the brain that uh, they're responsible for. So if you've ever seen anybody having an epileptic seizure, 
one of the things that happens, what used to be called a grand mal seizure, is basically every muscle in their body gets activated and they go totally tense for a little while. And that's because the different parts of the brain are responding to their muscle groups. Now, the thing is, when you are trying to isolate the little area where the epileptic seizure starts, you want to minimize the damage to the surrounding tissue. So this type of surgery is done under local anesthetic. This person is awake, and they are obviously clamped in place and immobile. And you might see these little squares right here. Before the surgeon decides exactly how to cut the focal area out, what they do is they take a very small electrical probe and they touch it against this membrane that covers the brain. And the reason the person has to be awake, they ask the person what they experienced. And for example, these early numbers, it's hard to see here, one, two, three, four, five through eight, whenever they were activated, the person reported their finger moving or feeling some kind of sensation in their hand. And when they got up to like 11, 12, 13, they were reporting memories. So this is one of the ways that we learn that the brain codes for different things. And that different parts of the brain, if you lose them, mean that you lose certain types of functioning. Now I want to show you a few what are typically called optical illusions. But what they really are is kind of tricks that our senses play on themselves. Because all of this stuff is kind of by the book, by the books, but our brain, our senses, the way they connect, and of course here we're talking about our eyes, they kind of give us a little bit of a different way of doing things. Now, by virtue of the way our eye is constructed, we see certain electromagnetic frequencies of light. Other animals see other frequencies. This is just what we work with. And you can see if you overlap what we call the three basic primary colors, that you get a whole variety of other ones. And white light can basically be created by simply overlapping these three basic red, yellow, blue things. Now, here you got to do a little bit of activity. What I want you to do is stare at the black dot. And while you're staring at the black dot with your peripheral vision, keep an eye on what happens to the gray haze around it. It tends to change the shape. This is not a GIF. This is not a cartoon. This is a static picture. The sensation you might have of change is actually being produced in your nervous system. Now, of course, you guys know these. I've, ever since I was a little kid, I know whenever they show you a picture like this and they ask you if it's horizontal, do they so you know it's horizontal, right? I've never, ever seen one where they ask you if it's horizontal or it's slopes. Yeah, it slopes. <laughs> but try as I might when I look at that picture, I sure have a hard, if I look at the whole thing, I really have a hard time seeing that. I can break it down and put a ruler next to a certain line and stuff, and then it becomes apparent. But looking at it like that, what you're doing is you're kind of playing with how your eye creates your field of vision in a horizontal way and in a vertical way. And because they don't quite line up, we get a little disoriented. And this kind of stuff can be a little disconcerting. This is also not a cartoon. Try to count the number of black dots if you can. Problem for me, I don't know about for you, but the problem for me is they keep moving. And again, this is a product of our eye and our brain working together, detecting various forms of light and dark, trying to create a coherent picture. Normally, we never run into this kind of stuff in nature, so it's not really an issue we have out in the so-called real world. But again, the point to all this is to kind of give you a little bit of a better understanding about how you are creating the world that you are experiencing right now. Now we'll throw another dimension onto it, and we'll get cognitive on you. And so here, what you want to try to do, and I suggest you guys do this out loud because it makes it more fun, is first read the words from left to right, from top to bottom. Go ahead. Read the words as fast as you can. <laughs> Did that work? Anybody have any problems? OK, now go through and do the same thing and say the colors. OK. 
<laughs> Seemed to take a little longer. Did you guys find you did that as smoothly as just reading, just uh, identifying the colors? See, somehow or other, color takes precedent in our, our ability to perceive color, which has presumably been very, very important throughout our ancestral past, takes precedence over our ability to read letters. And so as you were, I'm guessing, you know, that's because this is what happened to me, and I noticed you guys took a lot longer, but reading the words themselves was sometimes confused by the fact that what you were saying was contradicting the color. So it caused you to kind of slow down and be a little more deliberate. Yes? No? Maybe? Okay. So on the basis of that fact that we've already established, hopefully, that what's out there is ultimately a construction, or at least let me rephrase that, what we think is out there is a construction. What I want to do now is to introduce you to five different kinds of human realities. And this will go quite a bit towards helping us understand the relationship between myth and reality. And first of all, I'm going to talk about the big thing. This is an honest-to-goodness picture, by the way. I was looking for something really spiffy to put here. This is a Hubble Space Telescope picture from 2011. And this galaxy, who knows when in the past, apparently went through the other galaxy like that and pulled this other galaxy all apart. And this one got influenced, by the way, too. This is, well, this is reality. Although if we were a different kind of being, we wouldn't see it in these colors. And we wouldn't experience it, perhaps, in this type of frame. But this stands in for, you know, reality with all capital letters, if you will. Let's call it the universe. That's a pretty good word. Although in science and physics, there are some. We have a couple of physicists here. I guess there's some discussion about whether the word multiverse might someday soon replace the idea of universe. In other words, some physicists are actually playing with the possibility that there are multiple universes that interact, or maybe not interact with one another, but are existing parallel to one another, however that is. So there could be other things going on in this room, not just that you're not aware of because we perceptually can't understand it, but perhaps from another dimension that we're too old-fashioned, perhaps, to be able to pick up. I mean, the idea is staggering. So a sort of few things about the universe are worthy of mention for what we want to do. First of all, the universe, as we understand it, and of course, you know, kind of going back and forth through a scientific point of view sometimes because biocultural approach, biology rooted in science, the physical universe sets certain boundary conditions. In other words, there are walls, so to speak. Now, according to our current understanding of nature, for example, one wall is that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. That just seems to be, unless our physics change, seems to be a rule of nature. Then there's another law, with apologies to our physicists if I get this wrong, called absolute zero. And absolute zero, from what I understand, is a condition that's never been fully reached, but we get awfully close out in space. Absolute zero, there's no temperature, no heat, there's no atomic movement. Atomic zero, if we could reach it, psh, the electron would stop going around the nucleus. It would freeze in place. Doesn't seem like we can get much colder than that. Boundary conditions. So the point I want to make is, and even if these understandings change, or if I got them wrong, the point is that the physical universe has certain laws, certain principles, certain parameters. And you and I, as products of the physical universe, we have developed within those walls. So while we might be able to go outside of the walls in our minds, we cannot go outside of the walls with regard to our biological functioning. But another thing about our universe is it's not a static universe. It's dynamic. It evolves. This picture that you saw there is a relatively late stage in the life of the universe. From what we understand about the so-called Big Bang, it took hundreds of millions of years for the material that could ultimately form stars to even begin to take on the dimensions that would be necessary to support this kind of thing. This is a later event. 
And of course, stars blow up, and then they make more complicated types of compounds, heavier compounds. And eventually, psh, life pops up. Again, life evolves within the universe after the beginning of the universe. It is constrained by the physical properties of the universe. If nothing in the universe can go faster than the speed of light, I suggest to you that applies to biological organisms too. If atoms stop at absolute zero, then I would suppose that's a little too cold for biological functioning as well. So what happens is, as the universe gets more complex, it can bring forth more complex types of phenomena, but those complex types of phenomena become more bounded. They become narrower in the realm in which they can operate. For example, you and I, our brain functioning, which is an even higher level of the universe having evolved, our consciousness has to take place within a temperature of about 94, 95 degrees up to around 103 or 104, our brains. If we drop below that, our brains become kind of lethargic. They even can kind of shut down for a while. People who are going through open heart surgery, for example, will be cooled in ice packs. What that does is it slows down their metabolism, allows them to work on the organs for a longer period of time without damage. That's reversible. You can warm the person back up again, and here you are. On the other hand, if you go too far in the other direction, you have 104, 105 degree fever, biological stuff starts dying. And when the biological stuff dies, what it makes possible, what we call consciousness, is affected. So you could think of life as a higher order, more bounded property of the universe, and consciousness as a higher order, more bounded property of life. And of course, human consciousness, the kind that you and I are most familiar with, requires a certain kind of set of biological parameters, namely a human brain, as far as we can tell, to be possible. So we're always bringing forth new types of phenomena. And the big question, of course, is, and this is not just a scientific question, but a philosophical question, and you know, late night at 3 o'clock in the morning when the party's falling apart question, is all of this beyond our comprehension, ultimately? You know, there have been times when I thought, like, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, my friends and I worked it out. But in the morning, it just <laughs> didn't seem to be there quite so much, right? So just a few brief words about reality. Now let's start talking about how reality can be perceived. And I would imagine that reality, well, it's dead now, but reality through the perceptual apparatus of this giant squid that washed up on the beach in Newfoundland, the reality of a giant squid would be rather different than the reality of a human being. I mean, they live in the water. They go down to places that we call dark. They don't even have a skeleton. So, you know, their whole mass is supported by, by water. They got pretty good eyes. And they don't have hands and legs. They got these tentacle things going on. I mean, it's got to be a kind of a different way to do business, being a giant squid. I'd like to try it sometime, but, you know, <laughs> I can't do it in this particular body. So we're going to call this the species world. Seems like a pretty good name. And remember Mount Castle's starting point. We experience the universe through our senses, locked in the prison of our brain. Well, the nervous system, the brain of something like a giant squid is quite a bit different than ours in many ways. And the perceptual apparatus is different. The eyes and things like that. So they will not exactly experience the world the way we do, but they live in the same world. I mean, they live in the bottom part, the water deep down, we live in the air, but it's the same universe, right? Same boundary conditions, same can't go faster than the speed of light kind of stuff. And I want to give you a few examples of the perceptual apparatus of different types of animals, just to get you to think about it. We have our five classic senses that we talk about, our sense of sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch. And that's how you and I learn most about the universe. You know, whether or not there's something called extrasensory perception, the very name implies some way of knowing about the outside world besides these five senses. Well, that's a kind of an open question, an ongoing question. 
Some scientists might close the door on that a lot faster than anthropologists would. Because one of the things about anthropology is when other people around the world and other societies tell us that they believe something, that they do something, we tend to at least give them a little credence and try to understand what that means for them, even if inside we might be a little skeptical. But as we're going to see, other species have different types of senses. And even those species that use the same types of senses have variation. For example, doggies use the same kind of basic senses as people do, but dogs don't have quite the same focus on vision that we do. Dogs can see in the dark. Actually, obviously, if, it's, if they can see, it's not dark for them, right? It's just dark for us. And dogs can hear much better than humans can. They can smell much better than we can. I would say we can probably touch better than they can because that's one of the big things that our ancestors decided to go for, touch. So we have the same types of perception. In other words, we have similar brains with similar neuronal structures, but over the course of their evolution, they've taken a different path that's emphasized things different from our own evolution. And then there's even variation with regard to the channels that we use. So we're going to give you some examples of that. So before we do that, let's consider the implication. No species of organism has access to everything that's going on. That would be overwhelming. I mean, if you think about it, if you want to understand everything that's going on right now, the amount of processing power, of brain power, computing power, would exceed the collective power in this room. All the supercomputers in the world couldn't handle that. So over the course of our past, by virtue of a process that scientists call evolution, different types of organisms have, so to speak, decided to focus on this or that type of information. And the information that they focused on, of course, is the information that allows them to do what they need to do. And biological organisms, well, we'll talk about this in a minute, but basically they need to be able to do two things. So in your environmental niche, you need to be able to find food. And this dolphin does it in a very different way than we do. Dolphins, again, go down to a place that we call dark, whether it's dark for them or not. We can assume it is, but it's not dark in another way. Because dolphins, and it took us quite a while to figure this out, dolphins produce high-pitched sounds in their skulls, and that little kind of round thing they have over their head is an area of extra fatty tissue. And the sound goes through that tissue into the outside, and it goes through their bone into the outside, and then it bounces off objects, and the dolphin perceives the echoes. One of the big breakthroughs that helped us in the Second World War was us figuring out how to do this, how to send sound waves into the ocean, have the sound waves bounce off objects so we could detect submarines and other things underwater. And of course, now pretty much everybody can do it, so we have to use other ways of doing things. Bat sonar is quite a bit different. Bats don't produce sounds that travel through water, but through the air. Bats took us a while. It's only been like two to three decades, I believe, that we understand how this works. This bat has some pretty big ears, and what scientists long assumed was they use those big ears to hear the sounds of the moth's wings. We now know that's not the case. The bat emits extraordinarily high frequencies of sound. If you haven't blown your ears out yet listening to loud music like I have, you might be able to hear 19, 20,000 cycles a second. That's a super high-pitched sound. Some bats can produce over 100,000 cycles per second. This sound is so high-pitched that as far as you and I are concerned, it doesn't even exist. But with that extraordinarily short wavelength, a bat, for example, was flying in this room. If I would pluck out one of my hairs and hold it up, the bat could avoid running into my hair. That's how fine their perception of the world is because of this system. For you and I, it doesn't even exist. For them, they avoid running into each other. They catch their prey in midair. That's pretty cool. So that's one thing our organisms need to do. They need to find their food. The other thing that they need to do is find their mates. Otherwise, that's the end of the species. 
And this rather formidable-looking male silkworm will give us a great example. Pretty cool, huh? Not life-size. These are antennae. We call them antenna. They're not picking up radio waves. Picking up chicks. <laughs> Actually, in a manner of speaking. The antenna are picking up molecules. In other words, what we do with our sense of smell, they do with their antenna. And the male has these extraordinary antenna because one of the scents that he definitely wants to pick up is the sex pheromone called bombicle produced by the female. Now, we would have to have like a whole jar of this to be able to smell it consciously. But males can identify the source or the presence of a female with as little as 200 molecules of this scent. And of course, it's wafted along the wind. And males have been observed to fly over two to three miles to find a female following this scent. And of course, the closer they get, the more powerful it smells. But the irony is, and this is one of the advantages of eyes as compared to smell or antenna, if the female was sitting right here and the male was over on this other table, and the wind was blowing in that direction, as far as the male was concerned, the female wouldn't exist because he couldn't see her and her visual scent. This is what scent does. Scent gets carried by the air, by the water. Dire it's unidirectional, so to speak. On the other hand, if the female is like, I don't know, all the way in Simi Valley, and the wind's blowing from Simi Valley, He's going to be motivated. <laughs> and you can see how motivated he gets when he gets a little closer to her. And of course, she's much larger because she does most of the work. And what I mean by that is all he does is give her some sperm. The female has to make the eggs and the yolk for the eggs and everything else. Females really do do most of the work as far as reproduction is concerned, but males give themselves most of the credit. <laughs> and that's what he's been looking for. So food and mates, that's what it's all about in the biological world if we simplify. Obviously, you could argue for different species, there are other things. And of course, for humans, there are different. Another example, you ever wondered why fish don't run into each other when they're swimming around? They can actually feel themselves along the sides of their bodies. Some fish actually have color markings that reflect that. So one half of the fish will have one color and the other half will not. And there's a line of sensors of nerves that run the length of their body. And these nerves pick up electrical signals. Now, you might know that we all give off electrical signals, right? If you've ever had an EKG or an EEG, then what they're doing is they're strapping things on there and they're picking up your electrical signals. We don't really pick up electrical signals from each other. It's never been that important for surviving, for finding food and finding mates for us. But sharks do it. Duckbill platypuses do it. Fish do it. A lot of critters do it, especially water critters. But there's a few types of fish that have taken those electrical signals to a whole nother level. And by the way, ichthyologists, people who study fish, even in muddy, murky waters can identify what types of fish are present by the types of electrical signals they generate. Different fish generate different pulses. So if you're a, a fish guy looking for a fish lady, and of course, you know, you're not into the super kinky stuff, you want it to be somebody from your own species, then <laughs> you never know. Then you're going to look for the appropriate signal. You know, not that there's anything wrong with it, right? It just doesn't promote the next generation of fish. So let's move on. There's some really awesome stuff being done right now with brain research. If you guys are into this stuff at all, I would urge you to go to this website, thehumanconnectomeproject.org. UCLA is one of the laboratories involved in it. And what they are doing is they're taking some phenomenal high-resolution scans of people's brains while they're alive and doing certain tasks. And what this brain, this is what's called the connectome. So the idea, of course, is those of you who have a little biology behind you, your genes make your nerves possible. But how your nerves actually connect up is not just by virtue of genes. Certain cells make proteins, they make molecules, if you will, and that causes other cells to grow towards them. 
But in contrast to the really beautiful pictures you'll sometimes see when you look at an anatomy book, the results are a lot more messy. You'll see there's kind of like wires that kind of like go off in every particular direction, you know. And I suspect that as we understand this research a little bit more, we're going to find out that different degrees of, let's say, coherence or incoherence could be related to different types of abilities to understand things, perhaps what we might call different types of uh, processing disorders or cognitive issues. But who knows? This is called the connectome. You are, what you're basically experiencing to take Moncastle forward is you're experiencing the world through your connectome. Your connectome is the sum total of all of your connections between all of the neurons in your brain. So this brings us to what we can call the perceptual world. Remember, we've already talked about the universe and the species world. Let's talk about the perceptual world now. And the perceptual world, well, you share your perceptual world with all the other people in this room, but your connectome, to go back one picture, your connectome is going to be unavoidably different from everyone else's in this room. Because you're genetically different, but then you also have a biography that is different. So as a consequence, just the number of neurons that you have in your brain, the neurons that you have sending information to your brain in the retina of your eyes, in the ear, in your skin, those numbers are not going to be the same for every one of us. I mean, if you have bigger person, you have more skin. If you have more skin, odds are you probably have more nerves coming in. If you have more nerves, you need more processing power. This is one very fundamental reason why females in our species have smaller brains than males. Not because females are less intelligent. Don't even go there. <laughs> but it's because females have smaller bodies that the brain needs to deal with. You know, guys, even with our larger brains, we don't really get it right most of the time. So... If that's the case with regard to brain size, think about the fact that your brain, as it's connected to your eyes, your ears, is going to have a different number of nerves than mine. And of course, not only does it have a different number of nerves, but it's also going to have a different amount of what can be processed. Like I've blown a lot of my nerves out over the years in a whole variety of ways that I'm not going to tell you about today. <laughs> Staring at the sun too much, listening to loud music, it happens, right? and others. <laughs> so, you know, oh, to be young again and to have a fresh nervous system to play with, that must be quite a treat for you guys. So as you blow it and as you lose it, have fun and make sure you learn a little bit along the way, because that's what you're trading it for. And then, of course, there's differences in the way you and I are hardwired, in other words, the architecture itself, and differences in the way we're programmed. In other words, what we've been taught that things mean. You can do all kinds of exercises that can desensitize you to certain things. So for example, if you know, we've done experiments where people jump if you hear a sound, you know, like really loud sound. And even if you don't jump, you can see it in your nervous system, your brain, a <coughs> little spike happens. And if that sound happens over and over again, you start tuning it out, most of us. So think about the times, you know, when there's been this super irritating construction project going on outside. And you wake up in the morning and you first consciously hear it, and you go, oh, not yeast again. And then over the course of the day, you sometimes don't even hear it anymore. Or the leaky faucet that drips, drips, drips. Unless you're super hypersensitive that day and you get super annoyed, and then you can't hear anything but that. So just because you and I have a different connectome doesn't mean every day the equal parts or the same parts of the connectome are equally sensitive. Over the course of your day, as you get tired, as you wake up, after a meal, before a meal, different degrees of sensitivity are there. You can play with the sensitivity of your nervous system if you're dancing or playing instruments or meditating or through a whole variety of other techniques. And of course, how you learn to respond, your own programming. So if you do meditation, for example, you're taking a cultural practice and you're, in a certain sense, reprogramming how you respond to things, even if that's not what you're consciously doing. Because you're dialing down or dialing over the volume of things. This is uh, another illustration meant to say the same thing. Spanish scientist Santiago Ramón de Caldón won, a cabal, won a Nobel Prize in the early 1900s. He was an artist who turned into a neurologist and he was 
taking these new processes where they had where they stain neurons and look at them under a microscope. And these are actually cross sections through human beings in different parts of the brain at different ages. And the point I want you to understand is simply, if you look at the complexity of all these neuronal connections, it's essentially impossible that any two of us will have exactly the same network. In other words, our connectome is different. So even if it was possible through some science fiction turn of events in the future that I could take me, whatever that means, and down, you know, erase you and download me into you, I don't think I should be too surprised when I had the result and I finally got dialed in to see that the world is a different one from your perspective. I mean, to be super trivial, maybe you're a lot shorter than I am. So all of a sudden I start looking at the world from like five foot two. That's a little different perspective. But even more, maybe you're colorblind and I wasn't. Or, you know, maybe your ears are still fresh and young and intact like mine weren't. My daddy, when he was pushing 90, he got his cataracts taken out. And cataracts are when the lens of your eyes kind of gets thick and it gets kind of yellow and dull. And what really happens to you every day, you know, some nice things to think about, is every day the lens of your eye is getting like a little more dried out and a little more solidified. Now what this literally means is every single day that you're alive, until and unless you get your cataracts taken out, the world is less brilliant than it was the day before. It really is all downhill, guys. <laughs> and my daddy had them taken out, and he had artificial ones come put in, and he actually told me that he didn't recall seeing colors that vividly since he was in his 20s or 30s. And he even got rid of most of his prescription on his glasses. But it happens so slowly that we don't, don't notice it. So your perceptual world, a couple things we can say about it. Your perceptual world is opposed to mine. The giant squid that died on that beach in Newfoundland as opposed to the one that was still in the water. Our perceptual worlds are different and that they represent is a kind of a subset of what the species, what a giant squid can perceive. No giant squid, no individual giant squid perceives that. What human beings are capable of perceiving, no single one of us perceives all that. We all are individual versions of what the species is capable of. And of course, as we get older and wear out, those windows, so to speak, get smaller and diminish. And then, of course, how you understand what's going on. That is also different. Now, at this level of perception, we're talking about a kind of an automatic perception, an automatic understanding. Animals don't have human consciousness and human culture, and they can still see a rock, for example, or silk moth on the way to finding a female. Well, you know, through a little door like that, it might fly into the wall a couple of times, but any wall, any self-respecting silkworm moth that does that too often, he's not going to find the female, and whatever it was that made his sensory organs and his brain defective is not going to be passed on. Those silkworm moths that can thread the needle and go right out the door and find that female in Simi Valley, those are the ones that are probably going to make more silkworm moths. So none of us can experience what others experience. None of us experience the full spectrum of what a human can experience, simply on a perceptual level. And then we get into the cultural thing, which of course is grist for the anthropologist mill. I took this picture back in 1995 in India. There was a total solar eclipse. This is one of the really cool things I love. You know, we're so clever, we human beings. We can actually predict years in advance where the moon's shadow is going to graze across the Earth, and we can make a date with the moon's shadow. And we did that in 1995. We had to go. You know, you have to go where the moon's shadow is, right? This is going to be quite a production. 2017, we're going to be really lucky. There's going to be one in North America, but not in Moore Park. If you want to see the total thing, you're going to have to make an effort. So we went to this little tiny village, and you'll notice in this particular picture, there are no women. We asked about that. It's a village of about 8,000 people. And of course, the village elder, or at least the cool looking dude, he got to wear the eclipse glasses for a while that we brought. I don't know exactly how that worked, but you know, it's a great picture opportunity. 
The women, we found out, are all ensconced safely indoors. Because the Surya Graha, as they call it in Hindu culture, is not very auspicious. The light of the sun is kind of impacted and stuff. And it's believed, and I don't know how the culture got to believe this, but it's believed now, and scientists are trying to help change it, but it's believed that if a woman is outside during an eclipse and the light falls on her, that it can impact her baby if she's pregnant. And it can cause birth defects. And so, just as a matter of speaking, the women all stay indoors during that time. So, there's an interesting cultural thing. You and I have a totally different approach. I mean, there were a few women with us, European women, Japanese women, that were watching the eclipse. And, you know, they're all over the place. But the Indian women were all hidden away. So same reality, but a different cultural approach to that reality. Now, culture in anthropology has a very specific meaning. You're not genetically programmed to have a specific culture. Even though I grew up, I was born in Long Beach, I wasn't genetically programmed to be a Californian. Instead, we say we're genetically programmed to learn what the people around us are doing. And if that happens to be in Southern California, you tend to learn that. If it happens to be in Southern Mongolia, you learn that. You start imitating what their mouths do. You start imitating how they walk, their activities. And you also start imitating and internalizing how they understand the world. So just as it would be totally natural for us, to think of a solar eclipse as an amazing opportunity to see one of the unique phenomena that you can see on the planet, men and women alike, but make sure you protect your eyes. The cultural attitude of an India is make sure you protect your women because there's something that can harm them. Now the thing is, is what culture tells us what the universe means. But we have to learn that. Since it's not programmed, we learn it. So now we've got all these perceptions that are coming in, and our culture is telling us what they mean. This perception's interesting. That perception's bad. Don't even go there. This perception uh, didn't even know it existed. There are all kinds of things that human beings do around the world that Americans, for example, can't even imagine. There are other things that people do that Americans disapprove of even though in other societies it's totally normal. And there are, of course, many things that Americans do that other people disapprove of. Can't please everybody. But this is part of what culture is. If you grow up in a certain society, you internalize that. And it becomes, we even use the word, it's natural. Think about gay marriage, right? It's natural. Gay marriage is, is unnatural versus heterosexual in marriage, which is natural. There's nothing natural about marriage. I have never seen a BBC show about two mongooses, for example, after they go through their courtship display. You know, she wants him, but he says, sweetheart, we haven't got a ring yet. So they go to the main mongoose, and they get a little mongoose license, and then they say, I do, and then they go off and live happily ever after. Marriage is not natural. It's cultural. But we talk about it as if it was something now, the thing about your cultural world is it pre-existed you. It was around before you were born. I grew up. I was born in the Southern California. There was already, I know, I have to see pictures to believe it, and it's probably going to come shock to you. The world existed before you were born. I know this because I'm older than most of you, and I was here. <laughs> and so, as a consequence, the little baby human has to adapt to a world that pre-existed. And of course, that's what learning our culture is all about. We all learn it, though, somewhat differently. I learned it differently than you did, both because I was born and grew up at a different time. But even if we born and grew up at the same time, we were born and grew up in different groups. My family versus your family. Even if we grew up in the same group, my brothers, they learn it differently than me. Something about being the firstborn versus the other ones. Firstborns always have the toughest. The world that my older brother grew up in was a world in which he was the only bro for a while. And then I came along, and he had to adjust. But the world I was born into always had an older brother in it. And then I had these two other brothers show up. And so they always had that kind of thing going on. So we always learned a little bit different. Of course, 
We're different in our brains, different in our personalities. So we can think of the cultural universe as a kind of a virtual universe. It doesn't really exist in any one person. It's potentially out there. But what we exist, well, let's go back to our connectome. And again, look at all the unusual connections that differ from the, the beautiful pictures that they often put in anatomy books. What we end up with is each of us having our own personal world. And this really gets to the heart of the matter. And once we get through this, we'll come back and we'll revisit what myth and reality is all about. Your personal world, the world that you are living in right now, the world that you're experiencing, the world that you project onto me and everyone else, the world that you think is the universe. It's actually a very small part of the big picture. First of all, the only way you know about it is through your perception. And as I've hopefully already established, or at least tried to suggest, your perception is unavoidably different than mine. So literally, the world looks different from your perspective than it does from mine. It smells different. It tastes different. I learned something last semester that was interesting. I don't know how many of you guys, after you eat asparagus, you can tell a couple hours later when you go pee. Right? So good. That's about maybe 20% of the class. I found out that the reason some of us can smell asparagus after we pee, after when we're peeing afterwards, is because we have a protein in our DNA. Our DNA makes a protein that allows our nose to pick up this molecule that's out there. The molecule is out there. But those of you who don't smell it, you have, a, let's say, a poorer perceptual apparatus than I do in this regard. <laughs> now, you might think to yourself, oh, well, let me tell you, it's not an unpleasant, you know, it's just, right? <laughs> How many of you guys can smell your pee again? <laughs> yeah. I mean, are you grossed out by it? Or, you know, the first, the first time I remember smelling, it's like, that's curious. And of course, you got it then, it, then it goes away a day later, and then like a couple, couple weeks later, you eat some asparagus. You know, it took a while for me to figure out that's what it is. It's not unpleasant, it's just different. It's very unique. So in my perceptual world, the smell of asparagus pee is a possibility. In yours, it, you're invis it's invisible to you. Just a, a trivial example, right? And of course, the world that you live in is interpreted through your own unique filters. So some of the filters reflect the fact that you've learned your culture differently than I've learned mine. What you consider appropriate clothing, behavior, speech, whatever. And the second thing, of course, is that I have a biograph biographical story that's different than yours. Even growing up in the same family. Even identical twins have slightly different biographical stories. And of course, experience helps shape how you interpret things, too. So if you have different experiences, you already have a certain different way of interpreting things. Now, what your personal universe does and what mine does is it tells me what all of this means. All the stuff that's being fed to my brain through my nerves. My personal universe is trying to tell me what it's all about. So it's telling me what it means. And it's also telling me, you know, oh, yeah, this is cool. This is uncool. That's something you should do. That's something you should avoid. So it's also making judgments. Now, the thing that's really important, and which is a big object lesson for all of us, is that nobody has internalized a world that can fully explain the universe. In other words, our personal world is limited. And that means you're going to run into situations where it can't explain. Typically, what happens with people as they get older is well, you could be a kind of person who pushes the envelope, and then you've pushed the envelope so far that it's hard to figure out a way to push it some more. So you end up living in a bubble, but a big bubble. On the other hand, some people who live lives that are kind of repetitive and stay in the same place all their lives, they too live in a bubble. It's just a smaller bubble. And after a while, you tend not to even notice that it's a bubble. Most of the time, if you stay in your bubble, what you think the universe is all about is working, right? I know how to go to work on time. I know how to clean up the room after we're done. I know how to wash the dishes. I know how to make my food. I know how to find mates. All that kind of stuff that might be important, 
I figured it out. But what if I leave Southern California, for example, and I decide I'm going to go live in, I don't know, Burma, Myanmar. Don't quite, I could probably find food there. I don't know if I'd eat it. Because, you know, I got some dietary specificity. I don't know if I'd be too successful in maybe trying to find mates there because I'm not quite sure how you put the moves on in Myanmar. <laughs> so I've learned certain things here in my culture that might not translate to another. And finally, how you look at the world, how I look at the world, changes over your own lifetime. Who knows? Maybe after hearing this lecture tonight, you can have a slightly different view of yourself and your position in the world from last week. Fast forward 30 or 40 years, and all the other things you've learned, the subjects you've studied, the experiences you've had, you're going to look at the world differently again. I know. I don't look at the world the same way I used to when I was a college student. You guys probably don't look at the world. And I'm not just saying speak, but think about, understand, have the same values you have now that when you were in fourth grade. I mean, really what it comes down to, if you think about it, you live in a dynamic, evolving universe. As part of that universe, that means you are dynamic and evolving. Just like nothing else in the universe can ever stay static, you can't. But it's part of our brain to try to impose pattern, and we end up thinking we can be static. So in terms of the myth and reality that you and I live in, we can make a few closing statements. Reality. The big picture, the universe, ultimately unknowable. I'll, I'll, I won't even put a question mark at after that time. I'll just say, you know what, that's how it is. We're always going to be like a dog chasing its tail in terms of trying to figure out what's going on. Because every time we do figure out one thing, all of a sudden a whole bunch more stuff becomes a question. That doesn't mean the pursuit of knowledge is not worthy. It just means we should probably put it in our heads. We're never going to really know everything that's going on. And enjoy the fact, right? Gives you a little bit of wiggle room knowing that no one's really ever going to know what's going on. Kind of liberating, I think. Now, another thing to think about, and this is also very liberating. When I learned this as a, a younger student, this was the intellectual justification I needed for what I was already doing. Since your world is unavoidably different than mine, both the way you perceive it and the way you understand it, you just got free reign to be yourself. You can't be me. I can't be you. Why should we try? What's important is that we learn to communicate well with each other. So if I want to share my world, I know how to express it to you. And if you want to share or at least have your world, maybe not respected, but at least tolerated from my point of view, that you learn how to communicate that to me. You can already see this is one of the big problems we have in the world, is people that don't understand or allow for each other's worldviews. We think other people should think like us. We think other people even can think like us. This is impossible. This is one of the things I've trying to been arguing, subtext. Don't be surprised that people out there see the world differently than we do here in the United States. It's unavoidable. And it's not a judgment on American culture or theirs. It's just how it is. And the sooner we deal with that and accept it, I think the better off we're going to be. So if we don't live in the same reality and we can't access the whole big picture, then ultimately what it is, we all have our myths. I have no clue what's going on. You think I can live with that? Hardly. I have to have some type of foundational statement, a narrative, a story inside myself that will allow me to, to act as if I know what's going on so I can interact with others. This is not just a human thing. All animals do this. So in a certain sense, my way of understanding the world is a myth, and so is yours. Now, this doesn't mean all myths are equal. But we'll come back to the biocultural perspective because, you know, anthropology is always the anchor. And we're almost done, so don't worry. You learn your explanation, your myths of the world, by growing up in a group. So if you grew up in Southern California like I do, the chances aren't that bad that the myths you grow up with are much more similar than mine than, say, somebody who grows up in, I don't know, Aboriginal Australia. 
they have a very different set of stories about the world. One of the things that we do, and this takes us over to psychology too, the things we don't know, we tend to fill in the blanks. This means that. And our culture is partially what tells us to do that. So culture provides a narrative that helps us find our place in the world. When we're talking about our perceptual apparatus, when we're talking about our brain, we come back to the basics. We're talking about our brain architecture. We're talking about the way our brain is fed information by our nerves. Change your nerves, change how they function, you change perception. Being with a bunch of 18 to 22 year olds in this room, living as you do in Southern California here in the early 2000s, I'm guessing a few of you have already played with altering your perception <laughs> and experienced some of the things that means as far as, wow, put this in, look what happens. You're changing your brain chemistry. Maybe you're doing it through dancing or yoga or exercise, or maybe you have some more molecular ways of doing it. I don't know. But you're changing your brain chemistry, and look what happens. The thing about the myths that you and I live in is they help us have a sense of control. I mean, think about it. If we really have no clue what's going on, if we really knew that, we'd probably be paralyzed with indecision our entire lives, standing in front of the abyss. You can't function like that. So we act as if we know what's going on. This is one of the jobs of culture. A lion doesn't need to contemplate the nature of reality to hunt down a zebra. It doesn't even need to see the world the same way the zebra does. All it needs to do is, that looks like something that I've eaten in the past. I think I can eat it again. Let's do it. <laughs> and that's what's matter. There's a certain common thing that brings us together. So we can ask, are all myths equal? Because this certainly kind of suggests it. And I don't mean to say that they are. But we need to cut myths a little more slack. First of all, what is the myth attempting to explain? If we're talking about the origin of the universe, then the idea that Vishnu is dreaming the universe as he sleeps on the back of a coiled snake seems like as good a guess as, well, before the Big Bang, there was. But if you're talking about something in the universe, something that our senses can at least indirectly sense, like what are stars, or what does it mean to be a human being? Those are important questions, but now you come into a domain where we have different ways of trying to figure those questions out. And those different ways don't all have equally important outcomes. So how are we evaluating these myths? Is it just a story that makes sense? It fits with what I believe? Or it's just been what I people believe? You know, that's what my parents believe, so that's what I'm going to believe. Or are there different standards of evaluation? Can a myth be shown wrong? Now, this is something that many philosophers of science oftentimes talk about. Science comes up with experiments that are designed to show their understanding of the world wrong. We call it falsification of hypotheses. And this is one of the gold standards of science. You design an experiment, you run it, and you have a result that either disproves your hypothesis or at least doesn't disprove it yet. In other words, your hypothesis gains a little traction. But even in religion, religious models of the world, there are tests, even though outsiders might not consider them equally valued. If you're a religious person, whatever your religion might be, and that religion provides you with a foundation during, say, a moment of crisis, the death of someone, a disaster or something, then in a certain sense, that's a verification that your worldview is correct because it has helped you through this situation. Knowing how fast objects fall in one-sixth of gravity, for example, is not necessarily going to help you deal with the death of your spouse. So science has some really good ways of evaluating their myths, but the scientific myths explain only a little part of the things that humans are interested in. Other than that, it's kind of a free-for-all. So we compare the myth of science. And now some scientists and some people in here might think, oh, scientific myth? Don't you mean theory? Don't you mean law? No, I mean myth. 
Because as an anthropologist, one of the things we have to do is treat all people as equally worthy of investigation, as equally valid as sources of information. Now, I consider myself a scientist. It doesn't mean I'm putting down what myths of science are all about. But I do want you to understand, even if you're coming from a scientific perspective, ultimately, you've got three pounds of wet material inside your skull connected to a bunch of nerves via a few million neurons. And you're trying to figure out all of that ain't going to happen. So you're going to rely on an assumption. That assumption might be called gravity. That assumption might be called the ability of math to describe the world. It's still an assumption. A powerful one, but an assumption. So ultimately, if we're talking about myth and reality, guys, the take I have on it, reality is what there really is. Myth is what we think is going on. So maybe you don't want to use myth quite the same way. We thought, oh, yeah, the myths of that particular religion. Because there are a lot of myths of American culture, too. The myth, for example, that we are the shining city on the hill, that our country is somehow better than all other countries, that we have a historical destiny. It's called American exceptionalism. You're going to hear a lot about it in the, cause the election, presidential elections coming up. That's a myth. It's a myth that helps move America forward some days. And it's a myth that America trips over sometimes. Is it a myth we should abandon? That's what we got to figure out. So that concludes what I got to say to you. I'd like to hear what you got to say to me. Are there any questions? I believe there's going to be a microphone going around. And remember, this is just one guy's take on it. Don't think this, anything I said to you today means anything. That would be your first mistake. OK, so the questions, you're still going to have to speak up so I can hear you. Hello, Ron. Hey, how are you doing, John? Fine, um, there are people that have the didactic, uh, you know, memories, the photographic memories, mm -hmm. and do they interpret the world the same way we do? Because they're getting so much information and taking all that in. You know, when we look at something, we we look at it, we make judgment values of it, but it seems they almost have like a blank slate when they look at the world. I is their world, in a sense, more objective than ours? That's an awesome question that I can't even touch. I mean, but I think about, I mean, I used to have a better memory. Maybe, I don't know if you're like me, Ron. You probably had a better memory when you were younger. It's one of the things that happens when you get older is your memory gets kind of some holes in it. And uh, when your memory was functioning better, well, let me I'll just say, when my memory used to, I don't want to assume anything about you. When my memory used to function better, I used to have kind of more of an idea that I knew what was going on as far as relating things I had learned to what I was experiencing. So I can imagine if somebody had a photographic memory, and they were looking at something that that photographic memory had a record of, they could probably feel like either right at home or bothered by even the slightest different thing. I mean, can you imagine if like photographic memory of what was going on last week, and so I'm totally bugged now by the fact that some people are sitting in different seats. Maybe not bugged, but noticing it. You know, Aldous Huxley said about our brain in general, it's like a reducing valve. There's so much coming in that if we let it all in, we'd be overwhelmed. I don't know. It's not an issue I've ever had a photographic memory. Do you have one? Do you have one? No. <laughs> I mean, total non-answer, right? Um, any other questions I can avoid answering? <laughs> what an easy crowd. Are you all... Totally mind blown right now. Yeah. Can I can I steal your 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 if you will ideas for one more moment? When yeah, you look yeah. at because you're a cultural expert, so to speak. Um, when you look at various cultures, wouldn't you be able to get some sort of sense of a uh, a common reality by comparing cultures and looking at them and going, well, we all see the same thing, or are we all fooling ourselves? Well, that's a really that's a question that I can deal with a little bit more. The idea. You know, here again, what are we doing? We're, if we accept even a little bit of what I was talking about tonight, that you and I are living in a different world, that does us good only on a maybe a philosophical, existential level. On a practical day-to-day -day level, we don't act like that. If you're working at Starbucks and I come in to order a coffee, 
it doesn't really matter if you're perceiving the coffee, you smell it a little more than I do, or if the brown of the coffee is a slightly different color than mine. You know, what matters is that we can interact. And that's the problem when we look at other societies. We come to a point where we can interact. In anthropology, what we try to do is interact in their language. That's the first thing we have to do, right? So we have to try to access it in their language. But then if we do come to interact, let's say I go out, I'm, I'm in Nepal and I go out with somebody into the fields and I'm farming with them and I'm learning how they do farming. At one level, it's working and I'm kind of thinking like, oh yeah, I know what it means to be a Nepali that's doing farming. No, I don't. I think I know what it means. The kind of the gold standard in anthropology, can you act like the people in another society so they don't know that you're an outsider unless they look at you? But does that mean you have the same representations inside your head? Not necessarily. I mean, I think we can assume biologically that we have a common reality because we are the same species. But even that's kind of fuzzy. Because, again, to go back to people who are colorblind, uh, they don't perceive the world exactly the same, or people who are older versus younger. So, and you know, we have to be open to the possibility that there are certain extraordinary human abilities. We might describe them as pathological. You know, somebody who hears voices. In our society, we're going to put them in an institution or medicate them. In another society, they're going to become a priest or a shaman. Same experience, conceptualized in a different way. It's, Ron, you're touching on, on kind of the crux of the matter, but I'm not sure, if, at least I'm not capable of giving a definitive answer on that one. So once again, I'll weasel my way out of it. <laughs> Hand? Wait a minute. You're supposed to get the... Here comes the microphone. It's got to be recorded for posterity. Thank you. So you mentioned in anthropology you, you give equal credence to all myths of all cultures. Is there a standard, once, once you've considered all of them, where you, I suppose, evaluate the validity of them, I mean, I would imagine, for example, the myth of the scientific method probably gets a little more credence in the science of anthropology than, say, the myth of asking a priest whether or not this idea about creation is valid or not. And I, is there like a criterion for that? When, when we talk about different, you know, trying to look at all myths equally, objectively, or as being equal, what we're talking about is the starting point, right? It does me no good to go into another society prejudging my own society as better or worse, but just different. This would be very much like a scientist, you know, studying, let's say a chemist work in a laboratory, and for whatever reason that chemist really likes oxygen, but has a thing against nitrogen. Yeah, nitrogen sucks, right? That experimental work of that science is not, is not going to be in any way, shape, or form improved by that attitude. The, you know, the scientific idea is, you know, a dwarf star is just as interesting as a, a supergiant. But you might not study them equally because you might have a particular interest. So I don't know any anthropologist who will go equally to any society in the world. We all go to where we want to. But it's kind of what we aim for. The idea to go in without judging. Now remember, if you go into another society as an anthropologist or a backpacker, you are not going into that society the way you did as a little baby being born into that society. Now you're learning what all those people did. But when you travel to another society as an adult, and from the point of view of learning your culture, you guys are adults already, you're always going to experience that other culture through the filters of what you've already been learned or what you've already been trained to think. So if you go to another society and like they're butchering animals on the street, you might think that that's kind of barbaric because we butcher our animals in buildings with no windows on them so we don't have to see it, right? <laughs> By the same token, you know, if you're, let's say you're Jewish and you follow the kosher laws or you're Muslim and you follow the halal, then you see the way we treat animals when we butcher them here, it's barbaric, it's scandalous. So it's all a question of relative judgment. And the the anthropological idea is to try to become, if we can't suspend the judgment, at least become aware of the fact that we're doing it. Because that's the starting point. I mean, you're a human being, guys. We've already established your world is limited just like mine. And yet we're trying to figure everything out. Of course we've got our prejudices. Of course, prejudice, prejudge. We go into a situation, we've already got our little models in our head. The idea is to be aware of it. 
And I just have an inclination for science because, you know, I really about, I like exploring the world that lies beyond, but I'm really kind of intrigued by what we can know. And I really do like the idea of the so-called scientific method of developing thing tests of figuring things out that you can do over and over again. And every time you do it over and over and again, it comes up consistently. It looks like a better idea. But you know, in a traditional society, for example, if you can't find out where food is, maybe you hunters are not having much like, you'll, you'll consult a shaman or, or a religious leader. And what they might do is take a bone like a scapula, a shoulder blade from an animal that they want to hunt like a deer, and they'll throw it in the fire. And they'll let it crackle a little bit, and then that person will fish it out, and there'll be cracks in the, in the, in the bone. And they'll look at it, and they'll say, oh, yeah, the deer are that way. Now, in my worldview, there's no connection between how a bone burns and where the deer are. But in their worldview, there might be, because they're connected. That deer was once alive, this one isn't. But there's something else, too. If, if our hunters walk far enough in that direction, they're probably going to run into a deer. And the person who threw the thing in the fire and said, go that way, what just happens to his or her stock? It goes up. Oh, yeah, last time we didn't have any deer, we asked him. We got, and of course, by the same token, here's your empirical. If our hunters go in that direction for like three weeks and they don't run into a deer, you think we're going to listen to that guy again? We're going to give him another chance? We'll let her throw the scapulin and try it out. She says, go that way. We found it. She's our new person for talking to. So there is a certain trial and error and em empirical side to it. It's just maybe not exactly the same way scientists would do it. If you pray often enough that you get, s you know, people get sick all the time. And we'll try all kinds of crazy things out to get healthy. And if you do it and you don't die, we used to bleed people in Europe, right? And most of the people didn't die. So you know what? Looks like it worked. Let's do it again. <laughs> There's a certain kind of, you know, habit that we get into. Other questions? Well, thank you very much for attending. I think we have a final follow-up announcement here. But thank you very much for everything. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Those of you who are in my class, we're going to take a break now and come back at like 8.35, and then we'll take care of our business, and then we'll get a little more anthropological on what we talked about tonight, and we'll talk about what we have to do next week. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, okay, sorry. I thought it was...